All right, tox is cool, right? We like tox. Um, I run the Poison Center in Syracuse. Last night, two students at a university got drunk and went into the chem lab, which is, tells you what kind of students they were, and just were messing around, and they spilled potassium cyanate. And you can only figure out the outcome. Um, the older I get when I get tox calls at home, the more I listen to the polypharmacy that adults are on. And I'm always impressed by um, the psychiatric community, a group of people I have zero in common with, um, who have a tendency to take the most potent and most dangerous drugs with the most narrow therapeutic to toxic index and put unstable people on it. So I get these calls at 3 in the morning about a lady who took, you know, 40 beta blockers, 30 calcium blockers, you know, and this and this, and I'll go, that's a quality effort. You should let her go. Um, who the hell am I to get in the way of that? So it's, who wants to play God? I don't, you know. Now, kids are more fun and silly. You, you all, somebody has a kid in this room. Kids are born, they have two Apgars, and then they try to kill themselves, right? Kids uh, eat everything, put it in their mouth, taste it later. It's like college. Thanks, looks good, I'll taste it. So we're going to do cases, and kids are pure ingestions. We're going to do single cases, antidotes, and some exciting stuff that we're getting into. Some of this is pretty straightforward. We're going to review critical exposures. What do you do when advanced life support fails? What are your failures in treatment? And what are some of the rescue antidotes that are right at your fingertips that you can use to make yourself look really good and make the kid even better? The first case is called Nicole neurosurgery. It's a basic. These are all my cases, and they're embarrassing because sometimes I drop the ball. A two-year-old female has been sleepy for four hours. She was uh, fine in the morning, ate breakfast, went outside to play with the rest of her family in the backyard <clears throat> with her siblings, excuse me. And she returned to the home acting very strangely. She's had no real past history. She's a healthy uh, child. On exam, when she comes in, she's got some striking findings. She's a little tachycardic, but her rest of her vitals are okay. In general, she's very, very sleepy, very non-focal, and very irritable when stimulated. Her pupils have about an 8 millimeter discrepancy, but they work. They're reactive. Now, a fair percentage of the population is anisocoric. Fair? You always ask a parent if they've seen it before. Ki parents, even the most uninformed and limited parents, know all their kids' defects. They're pretty good with that. But this was very, very discordant. Um, and, but they worked. Our fundi were not seen. It is important for me to be straight with you when I give you these cases. Uh, I love dictating charts where I sort of tell the truth, like tympanic memory it's not visualized. Fundi not seen, you know, heart rate of 200, and the med student hears a, you know, I hear a heart rate of 200, it's like that. And the med student says she hears a grade 3 mid-diastolic diamond-shaped crescendo murmur. So I dictate the truth, and I feel good about it. Um, but I couldn't see the fundi on this girl. She was floppy, and neurologically we have problems. She's, she's got focal deficits, okay? Now, um, what's bad about this? We know that we're worried about a focal event. Number one. Number two, who are we probably going to have to call to look at this kid with a, went out, was fine in the morning, went out and came back in tough shape? We're going to have to call neurosurgery, right? Sadly. What are, what are, you gonna, what are they going to tell you on the phone? Two things. Call me after the CT and don't paralyze her until I do my complete neurologic exam, right? Which consists of a pen light and uh, squeezing their toenails and that's it. Um, it's, it's, I learned so much by watching the neurologic exam. It's, it's like going right back to med school. Um, so she's also asymmetric and I'm not happy about this. So what is her problem list? She's got altered level of consciousness, uh, unequal pupils and focal deficits. This is not a joke. This is a scary kind of case in real time. So we sent labs, and I'm embarrassed. I got a CBC, which clearly causes focal neurologic deficits. That was good. SMA7 is send off. My, my house, we have ISTAT now, and we get it quickly, but at that time, uh, a 7 took about, a BMP took about an hour. Oh, uh, we ordered a CT, got a urine tox, uh, which I really didn't order, but it was done. And what's next? So the worst thing, you're gonna, we'll go over the basics here. The CT in her was normal. That happened in about five minutes. The CBC was completely normal, don't bring it up. Uh, but the BMP comes back with a sugar of 10. So what do you do when you get a lab that doesn't make sense? Wake up, what do you do? You repeat it. How many times? <laughs> no, you repeat it once. <laughs> uh, it's like oximetry, you put it on the left arm, it's no good. Why do you put it on the right arm? It's half the body, not whatever. 
Um, so we did a chem strip, which was zero. Not good. Grandmother lives in the home. Now, I'm in AARP, which is totally freaking me out. Um, so I'm not going to get, they're going to show up at my house and shoot me, but grandparents are very dangerous people. They, uh, they, Marianne knows this story. You know, my father-in-law used to come to the house. He was cardioactive, best, best path. He used to put all his meds on the table, and my little girl would go over the edge, and it was, oh, Dig, Lasix, beta blockers, you know, Disney World. Um, so they're not exactly hip to the fact that kids are very facile with getting to drugs. Some of her sugar pills are missing, Gliburide. We gave her D50 after I spent $2,700 working her up, including her stuff, and she's all better. Hypoglycemia is the only metabolic cause of focal deficits. That is a not mass effect. The key here was that the fact that her pupils worked. If she had a super or an infratentorial lesion, you'd have some real frozen third, fourth, sixth nerve palsies. It's well known in the tox literature. If you look at the causes that are progressive of altered levels in kids, take a look at the list. You live and breathe this in every age group. You worry, if I came in out of it, did I bleed in my head? You're going to scan me in a heartbeat. Number two, if I'm febrile, I am tappable. If I am out of it, completely wasted, you're going to give me Narcan. What is the only contraindication for Narcan? When I was a tox fellow at Bellevue, I gave Narcan to an addict. He woke up, and he was chasing everybody around uh, the ER. And uh, I don't know if you've ever worked in New York City, but USC is probably the same as UCLA. Our nurses in, at Bellevue, unlike Syracuse, the nurses at Bellevue are, to be kind, uh, extremely difficult. And I said, what do I do? And they said, well, you woke them up, you deal with it. Um, <laughs> it's the truth. And hypoglycemia. My point is, and I love Marianne's slide, what is our job? Our job is to rule out the mass, fix the sugar, wake up the stoned, and treat the meningitic. If you do all those things in the first 20 to 80 minutes, take a breath. Then it turns into grand rounds, and these are the grand rounds causes, okay? I'm not going to get into all these, but these are mostly diagnoses of exclusion. And Marianne mentioned AEIOU tips, which is here. The problem with mnemonics, I always tell this, is I remember the letters as I get older, but not what they stand for. Um, the one here that's a very big caveat for all peds people is in a susception. Be aware that in can look very out of it. The take-home message here is chemstrip, chemstrip, chemstrip. Just do it. And anybody can have it, and remember, it can cause asymmetry in neuro. Simple case, I blew it. Okay, it's 8 in the morning, 9 in the morning, 10 in the morning. I can't remember decades of my life, but I can remember the room I've seen your patient in. I don't understand this. I've been in Syracuse too long. I'll be walking around, and Mom will say to me, Oh, you remember you took care of my daughter? So the first thing you want to be sure is that they're living and the second is you remember what room they're in. So at 8, 9, 10 in the morning from one of our more affluent suburbs comes this girl in, whose mother claims that overnight she turned into that girl. <laughs> in she comes, the history, 10-year-old. She's possessed, the mother says. Now it's quiet in the waiting room, so we wheel her right back. Although I wanted to leave her in the waiting room because she was freaking out and she was scaring the adults, which I liked. Um, she, <laughs> She's presently recovering from chicken pox and been doing well. No stiff neck, nausea, or rash. Um, the last part is, I'm having a moment with my fingers here. She did not take any aspirin, which everybody knows uh, can cause some Bry syndrome, but that's not happening. On exam, her vitals, she's febrile, not good, altered and febrile. Tachycardic and a bit hypertensive. Her general exam, she was incredibly pissed off, this kid. Uh, the mother was mortified, saying she never talks like this. She's never like this. And this kid was talking like uh, I do. <laughs> and, um, I mean, she was just wonderfully foul. And, um, and the mother is, like, mortified. You know, mom was, like, an eastern suburban mom. You know, the clogs match the sweater and um, Brugger's and not good. And each -E and t exam was real. And this is when it got fun. Her pupils were big, 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 big. Real big, but they worked. Pharynx was dry. Her neck was supple. Chest was clear with a heart rate that was up. Uh, belly, she had a suprapubic mass, which was from nowhere. She's 10. A little palpable mass. Um, and absent, absolutely absent bowel sounds. 
The neurologic exam was just non-focal agitation. She got a little annoyed when stimulated. Her skin was filled with dried chickenpox lesions. So take a look at our girl here. Her primary survey, her ABCs are intact, her sugar we did do was normal, her CNS issues, and she's encephalopathic. Let's get to the point. And everybody here knows the drill here. She's febrile encephalopathic. You know, A, you're going to tap her at some point. B, you'll scan her before that. C, you'll probably antibiotic uh, load her if you're worried. And you'll do the esoterics in the interval, which is no doubt worth it. So here's another look at it. But if you flip her around a little bit, her pupils are too big and really big. And, and you've got to pay attention to that. The pupils are an autonomic clue system for a tox exposure. And if you take a look at the possible encephalopathies in the world, she could be infectious. It's unlikely that she's metabolic with all the fever and turned on inflammatories. And organic psychosis is off the table. Investigations, normal labs that we got. Ammonia, obviously, for Rye syndrome. We talked about it. And, and trust me, Marianne's checkoff list for bad looking kids is the rock and roll of it. Lactate, that stuff is great. CSF, CTs, it's going to happen. It took a lot of Versed. I'm going to tell you right now, it took 14 milligrams of Versed to quiet her for the tap. Anybody here ever get Versed for a procedure? Anybody? Seriously. Okay. Two milligrams will put you under to get a knee scope or whatnot. Tox screen is negative. Could she be anticholinergic? Take a look. Does she fit? Dry, flush skin, it's warm and red because she's not sweating and she's vasodilating, dry mouth, no salivation. She's got dilated pupils and blind, vagal blockade with a heart rate, ileus, no bowel sounds, and she's crazy. She fits. What's out there? How do we get anticholinergics? Benadryl is legal. You can get it, and antihistamines match up. They cause anticholinergics. Antipsychotics, the list is there. Lomatil is, um, is a wonderful antidiarrheal med, combination of... Um, Basically, uh, an atropine agent and opiates. How many of you have heard of Lomatil? Anybody? I recently came back from India. I went there uh, with Lomatil in case I picked up one of the pathogens. My wife took it, and it was about three months ago, and she's yet to have a bowel movement, so we're good. Um, it's a great drug. She's gained a little weight, but she's good. Anything can do anticholinergics. The antihistamines, I already told you, they equal in overdose atropine. You want to remember one thing. So acid is makeable. If you give me an hour in my lab, uh, I can make you acid if you want it. You don't want to know that. And the treatment of anticholinergic uh, syndrome is physostigmine, which is wonderfully named antilirium. It's a great drug. It costs 42 cents. It's so off patent. You, it's right up there with penicillin from Alexander Fleming. Okay, So you can give it. And what we did here is we gave her some which is the most fun day for a tox person, and she got straight in a hurry and she was fine. Now, how did she get anticholinergic? Topically applied Benadryl. In the beginning, God made calamine lotion, right? This creamy stuff. Then let's, somebody said, let's put a highly active toxic drug in it called Benadryl. So you can rub it all over the 230,000 chickenpox lesions you have and cutaneously absorb it. And this girl, some was good, more was better, and that was what was wrong with her. Nice case. So remember, anticholinergics make you crazy. Next case, bad night to be on call. A baby who is normal comes in, and he's picked up some bad habits. Um, <laughs> my slide. Who showed that at the PEM assembly? It was my slide. Oh, it was uh, Chris. The history, four-month-old, diarrhea, vomiting, looking ill, right in the middle of rotavirus season. He's well until three days. Parents, stay, they can't count his stools. They're so, they're so frequent. Any of you who've dealt with rotavirus knows how hellacious it is as an attack on the hydration of, of, a, of a child or an infant. The anemesis is sporadic, non-bilious. Others in the home are getting better, but they uh, had it at once. So we have a four-month-old with rotavirus in, in your mind. The rest of the history, they don't like his color. He's not really febrile, no rash. They can't tell you if he's peeing because he's pooping so much. And he's immunized. Four month old, not looking well, diarrheal illness. On exam, his vitals, he's a little febrile, tachycardic. He's breathing quickly, 60. Pressure is reasonable. His SATs are 88% in room air. Put it there. General, tired, barely responsive. Chest is moving, no murmur, nothing. Clear lungs. The rest of it is listed. He has delayed cap refill. So if you look at his symptom complex, he's got hypoxia, right? 
He's ashy and he's got poor perfusion to kipnea and diarrhea. As the EM people, we know the drill here, ABCs. 88% sat is not enough. You put him on, how much O2 do you want to put him on? 100%. And it did nothing. It went up, you'll see, it didn't do much. Uh, we gave him some volume as well. What's the framework? Could it be septic? Anybody can be septic. Unlikely with that sat. We gave him cultures and antibiotics. Is he in compensated shock with his rate and his pressure matching up? We gave him volume. Is he cyanotic? What do we do? Does he have heart disease? Does he have lung disease or other? And we'll get to that. We're still stuck on that sat. The intervention and response, we gave him the bolus. Marianne is right. There's no amount of fluid you shouldn't give. His sats in 100% went up to a majestic 80%. He failed his hyperoxia challenge. However, his chest film is gorgeous. His EKG was gorgeous. He had no heart or lung disease that you could hear of. Here's his gas in 100% O2, and that sort of makes the diagnosis for you. He is able to dissolve oxygen, right, his PO2, but he can't carry it, which basically tells you his hemoglobin is quite messed up. Blood was spilled on the stretcher and turned brown. Anybody seen this disease? What was your etiology? I'm sorry? Really, Reglan. Anybody else see it? It's less so now, but it's out. It is methemoglobinemia. It's when iron goes from plus 2 to plus 3 to ferric. And unlike CO poisoning, where the affinity of the hemoglobin for the oxygen changes, in this regard, the ferric uh, moiety of hemoglobin is incapable of binding oxygen, and they just wave at each other. Going back to the gas, and I don't mean to be pathophys on you, dissolving a gas is easy, a PO2, PCO2. Carrying it is the physiologic response. What do you do? How do you know it, how did you get it? All right, there was a drug back in the 70s called snappers or poppers. Has anybody heard of those? Come on, cop to it, all right. In the beginning, before, DIG, before nitroglycerin tablets were available, amyl nitrate was available as a cardio vasodilator. And it was put in spantules like ammonia capsules that you could crack and put up to the nasal passages of a cardiac anginal patient and end up with true vasodilatation of the coronary vasculature, which is good. Somebody figured out that it also gave you one hell of an erection. This was the Viagra of the 70s. And they put it in inhalers and they capped it. It was big with the, in New York, my, my world, in the homosexual community is snappers and poppers. Um, and it would cause a tremendous amount of a migranous component, but other things were working better. Um, it's not gone. There's jolt, there's locker room, nothing's ever gone. Uh, infectious diarrhea is listed here, and I, I point that out for you, because if you're a very young baby and you make a nitrates from an infectious diarrhea in the large bowel, it's just like drinking well water or nitrates. Benzocaine and lidocaine, how would a baby get those two? Or a gel and ambacil, benzocaine. Very, very common. Quinone, sulfonamides, naphthalene, it's a longer list, but many things can cause it. The treatment is methylene blue. Tell the parents what you're doing. You're hanging blue liquid into a kid. They're going to freak out. The kid's blue. Some parents don't get it. Methylene blue, by the way, is a wonderful party favor. If you want to put it in a friend's uh, drink when they're having a beer, they'll pee blue for a day. I took rifampin once for a, med uh, for a meningococcal kid, and the next day I was in the bathroom, and I looked down, and I said, oh, my God, I have bladder cancer, because rifampin turns you orange. Okay, this child had a high methemoglobin level and got methylene blue. This was just rotavirus. Teaching point, cyanosis that's unresponsive to hyperoxia in the absence of heart and lung disease is hemoglobin disease until proven other otherwise. Okay. Now let's talk about some contemporary stuff. That was easy baby stuff. And you've seen this. And you might, USC seems to see everything. I, dengue, I, that's why I work where I do. EMS call, Southeast Asian, three-year-old comes in in status. Pre-hospital care involved rectal diastat out of van to no avail. An interpreter is called, the child arrives in status. In Syracuse, we have a lot of immigrant populations, usually from the really oppressed uh, areas of uh, mid-Africa, and uh, it's a challenge to really get down and dirty with what everybody's been exposed to. The vitals are listed. He's turned on tachycardically. He's obviously uh, seizing, nothing really dramatic. His atraumatic exam, his pupils are sluggish. I can't see his fundi. He's seizing, no obvious abnormalities. 
So what's everybody's first line drug for status? What, IV, pick a drug. Ativan. We okay with Ativan? How many doses are we going to go till we move on to drug B? Ballpark. What do you usually do in general practice? Anybody? How many doses? Three. You might use three. And then you might add a second drug. What's the downside of too much Ativan? What could happen? It could become apnea which to me is not a big deal. I told you that intubation is what we do. So the intervention, we got a line in, we gave three lorazepams, we loaded them with phosphenatoin, no such luck. We gave him 20 per kilo of phenobarb, and he stopped breathing. Well, that get one thing off the table, but just because he stopped breathing doesn't mean he stopped seizing electrically. And we intubated him. We got labs back, we sent a lot off, we scanned him quickly. No metabolic disarray here. What in the world's going on? Well, the family shows up, and an uncle in the house has TB and takes medications. And he thoughts now. This is a big deal. And it's isoniazid, INH. And it all starts with GABA, the thing that's putting you all to sleep now. Or me. <laughs> uh, GABA is the transmitter. And basically, you can see the synthesis here. And what INH does is it blocks pyridoxine phosphokinase, and you then decrease the GABA. This is going to happen to somebody who takes too much. The pyridoxine, the B6, is the antidote. Everybody knows about this. There's really no downside to using it. You'll hear in my talk, there's listings of the dosing. Then grams should equal the amount of ingested. We don't usually know that. There's some recommended one gram every two to three minute doses. This is one of those things you've got to look up because there's no reason why you should remember it. This child got five grams of pyridoxine. He got better, and we found the INH in the house. So refractory status, think pyridoxine, especially in a transient population. All right, I'm going to end now with scary stuff. Um, there's probably no one, I mean, in the old days, Marianne can remember this, although, by the way, Marianne just finished her residency and she's brilliant, uh, quite young. Um, I remember the day when um, a kid would sign in the ED and when you, the nurse did the intake triage under meds, it always was just either Tylenol or Motrin, or, you know, something easy. Isn't it amazing how much younger kids are now who are on psychotropics? It's astonishing. And, uh, it just seems that everybody's on some mood, some serotonin, some ADHD, right? What's a pop quiz? Are ADHD drugs abused? Big time. You can always tell because if the kid's running around the room, going crazy, full of ADHD, and the mom's rail thin and peppy, she's stealing the drug. <laughs> when my daughter was at school, uh, ADHD drugs were completely sold. Um, it's a big abuse thing. So psychotro psychotropic meds are out there. But also, there's almost no one out there who's not on some degree of a cardiotropic uh, med as well. And I'll show you what I'm getting at. A two-year-old gets into grandpa's heart meds. This is a nightmare for you in service and me on phone as tox or working in the PZD. They only found a bottle open of verapamil sustained release. This could apply to everything I'm about to tell you applies to beta blockers too. But let's calcify this and stay on that. Child is brought to you within 15 minutes, 45 minutes rather. The vitals, his heart rate is 60, a little low for a two-year-old who should be scared to death. His respiratory rate is okay. His pressure is not acceptable. SATs are okay. Somnolent. Good cap refill, however. Kids are amazing. They'll maintain their cap refill till the bitter. So it's calcium channel blocker overdose, and I don't want to glaze you over with autonomics, but this is very cool stuff. We know what calcium channel blockers or beta blockers do. They depress all the things I've listed here. Children look great until they crash like stones. It's just like Marianne told you about shock. Life's good, and then I'll see you later. They have alpha tone up the wazoo, and they maintain the vascular integrity, and they drop. Therapy. Now, you do not make them vomit. Don't make anybody vomit. You do not lavage them. The best you can come up with maybe is some go lightly. Because these kids are going to go crash on you, number one. And number two, think about it. If I orally stimulate them, they'll gag. And they'll have a vagal event on top of a beta or a calcium channel blocker event, which is really cruel. So stay out of it. Two lines. Start drugs. If I came in to see you, Brady, you'd hit me with some atropine. I mean, it's a standard armamentarium. It is clearly the drug of choice for kids and people who have symptomatic. But if for some reason it just doesn't seem to work, 
for the calcium channel or the beta channel blocked patient. Calcium chloride sounds like an antidote, doesn't it? And basically, you put so much in the extracellular level that it can diffuse across a blocked receptor, and you might get some effect. But remember this theme, it's short-lived. It does work, and then you take it away. OK, I'm going to give you some catechols. Why not? And there's a lot of case reports that give you the same transient story. I've listed every vasopressor known to man from epi to vasopressin. But it doesn't last. So what else can we try? And this in front of you is pretty much the standard diagram for myocardial muscle and the transmitters. And you can see the blockers effect in calcium channel, and the portal is closed. However, take a look over here. You actually have a glucagon receptor at the, at the cardiac membrane and vascular membrane. And you also have an insulin receptor, which is where I'm going to end teaching you about now. Glucagon, everybody knows the board question. What do you do with a refractory beta blocker overdose who doesn't get better on this? You give them glucagon. That's why you're going an end around the calcium channel, which is great. It has significant effects. It bypasses the beta receptor blockade or the calcium receptor. You get adenyl cyclase, yada, yada, and you perfuse. This is where we're going if glucagon doesn't work. And it's called high-dose insulin euglycemia. There's a promising treatment with patients who are treated with either calcium channel blockers or beta blockers. Insulin in and of itself has a positive inotrope. Insulin in and of itself obviously incorporates carbohydrates, sugar, into every cell in your body. That's why you give it. The problem with diabetes is not hyperglycemia. It's the fact that you have unavailable sugar that won't be metabolized and you become acidemic. So it does work for met metabolic use. It's postulated, though, that if you give somebody a lot of pressors, you're going to burn heart muscle and vascular muscle, which isn't good. But it's impressive as well that the reason they came to this conclusion, we did, Tox World, is CCB overdose patients were usually hyperglycemic, and we had to jump in with insulin. And lo and behold, when the insulin was given, they seemed to do better, which is how everybody investigated this. And if you look at the regimen, there's one here, it's just like diabetic treatment. If the sugar is very low, you get their sugar way up with a bolus of dextrose, and you maintain an infusion, so substrate, and then you hit them with insulin on the back end. And they do very well. And the case resolution, he crashed like a stone. We gave him volume and atropine, it went away. Calcium went away. Glucagon stayed well for an hour. In the PICU, he had HIE, and he went home well. Nice case. You're going to see these. They're going to be sent in your ED from the talk center because one pill can kill, which is the point of the talk. And the summary of what we're doing here is, number one, consider glucose as an antidote for anybody who's odd because the chem strip is too easy to miss and too easy to get. If you're crazy and encephalopathic, I just want you to keep antihistamines or anticholinergics in your head, and you do have an antidote. Hypoxemia that doesn't get better with uh, supplementation with O2. You might think of methemoglobinemia. Pyridoxime is, is, is a great antidote for the exposed refractory status patient. And as I mentioned, glucagon and HIE are things that are used. We use them all the time and whatever. So basically, that's the, point, the case I wanted to give you this year. They're going to change year to year because kids find a way to get in bigger trouble.